Hello, I'm Emma Bruner, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Today's guest is Jennifer Horbelt Bonds, co-anchor of WPSD Local 6 in Paducah, Kentucky. This is Scott Williams, the host of Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, where every single week we talk about the history, the people, and the culture of our home. I'm here in the West Tennessee region. I have a really exciting guest I've been looking forward to talking with today. I have Jennifer Horbelt, who is the co-anchor of WPSD News in Paducah. Um, Jennifer's the person that I get my news from every night. Thank you for keeping me employed. I appreciate that. No. <laughs> you, you are very welcome. So um, you also have ties to to this area very very Thank much you. so. So, um, but I and, and also uh, you're a Memphian, a former Memphian. Uh, you've I am. Been a lot mm-hmm. of time there. We have a mutual friend I noticed on Facebook the other day, Roswell and Cena. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> you know you you referred to him when you shared one of your original. Um, one of your, from your, uh, your sample clip, your, whatever you guys yeah. call that, your, we call it, uh, we call it a reel. Your montage. reel. That's right. Yeah. That's it's right. basically an audition tape for, for TV news. So yeah. And it was really <laughs> fun to see, uh, see Memphis things from, from way back then. So that, that was good. I figured you recognize some of the landmarks that are in that video. <laughs> oh, very, very much so. <laughs> yeah. So back us up to the beginning of where, where were you born and what was your childhood like? Okay. So I'm original. I'm a Texan born and raised. I was, I was born in Houston. Um, my dad actually was born in Galveston and his family, they're from the Northeast and my mom's kind of from everywhere, but my dad was born in the Houston Galveston area. And that's also where I was born and raised. Um, I had a, I mean, a great childhood. Um, I was really lucky and uh, grew up kind of middle-class and Uh, Kind of a typical, if you're familiar with a big city like Houston, kind of a typical uh, suburban neighborhood. What did your parents Um, do for a living? So my dad was a dentist, um, but he actually specialized in working with people with special needs. So uh, he, that was his specialty. Um, He was actually recognized nationally and internationally for his work um, with people with special needs. Um, not, uh, an easy job by any means. Um, it's hard enough to be a dentist, uh, for people like you and I that understand what's happening. Um, but he worked with the severely, uh, developmentally disabled. So, um, these are people in many cases that, uh, really did, had no idea on concept of what was happening to them, uh, when they would go to the dentist. Yeah, I've never so, even thought um, about that. That's, um, yeah. that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a, a job that he was very passionate about and that he loved but it also was a very difficult job. And so um, uh, it it definitely was was stressful. So um, so he grew up doing that. And I would say one of the things that I really appreciated about that growing up, and it's kind of given me a a heart, I would say, for the special needs community is um, I just, I'm grateful to have had that exposure. I think a lot of people don't recognize um, that there's a whole spectrum when it comes to special needs. Um, you know, there are people that can't live on their own. And that's who my dad worked with. Uh, he worked at a place in Memphis, just outside of Memphis called Arlington Developmental Center. Um, no longer uh, is open, actually. Um, but uh, and then he worked at a place down in uh, Texas called Richmond State School, which is people that couldn't live on their own, not even like a group home, uh, more like a hospital. So the severely. But then there are people that, I mean, work in our local grocery stores or, or that we, we see in school at um, have a, a developmental disability. Um, so it's it's an area where like there's a lot of stigma that's been attached to it over the years. I think a lot of that stigma is going away, but I was exposed at a very young age to that and uh, it never seemed strange to me. So it's been kind of a joy to be able, at, as I've progressed in my career, um, to be able to expose people to that and educate people about that. Um, we here at WPSD, we have a, the Telethon of Stars every year which is all about supporting people with developmental disabilities. So that's been kind of a neat connection, I feel like, that I've been able to have with my dad. But um, my mom was a nurse. So they were both in the medical field. Yeah, my mom was an RN. And uh, I just, you know, they wanted, I think they both were thought I might go into the medical field. And uh, it was very obvious to me from a young age that that was not something that was going to be for me. I didn't (laughs) didn't have a stomach for it. (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting that they both were in that and that you went a whole nother direction. Oh, yeah, totally different direction. But, you know, though, my dad and I, my dad was absolutely obsessed with movies 
and film. Um, we grow up. I mean, he was the guy at the family reunion who was never in the pictures, who was never in the video because he was taking the video. He always had his camcorder, so he's taking pictures. And um, you know, the more that I think about it, I do think I was very influenced by that. I I thought it was cool that he was documenting our lives. Um, and now I have all these videos and these pictures that um, he and my mom both. My mom was really into taking pictures growing up. Um, and just documenting documenting our lives um, growing up. And so for me, I think that really kind of made a mark. Um, yeah. Are they still and, around? Are they living? Well, my dad passed away actually in 2009 and, okay. um, and my mom is, is, is still alive. Yeah. My, that was, that was tough. That was a, that was a rough year. Uh, 2009 was, was really difficult. Um, my dad was uh, 54 when he passed away. Oh, wow. Um, he was young. Yeah, he was. And I had actually just gotten the uh, evening anchor position here and, it was tough. So yeah. he uh, got to see you doing he something did. that he, he enjoyed, which is very cool. Oh, he thought, I mean, <laughs> it was almost embarrassing. He helped me when I got the <laughs> evening anchor job here. I finally had the money to live on my own, like to get my own apartment. And um, he helped me move in. And he, we went to Home Depot. I, I think we had to get plumber's tape for my washer because it wasn't fitting, you know, just right. And of course, he's dad and he's going to make sure it's right before he leaves. And uh, we're in the Home Depot here in Paducah, and he, uh, <laughs> there's the guy is helping us find the plumber shape, and he's like, I just was, you know, I wanted to make sure you recognize my daughter. She's about to be the evening anchor. It's, she works for WPSD News Channel 6, and we were News Channel 6 at the time. And so he was very, very proud, and I think really excited that I was doing something that I was really passionate about. But, um, but anyway, yeah, that, he had a that's big awesome. personality. That's yeah, a great he had a big story. Personality. Mm-hmm. He's, um, he's a cool cat. <laughs> how, did you, how did you end up, at some point, you end up at UT Martin? Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. so how does, how does a young lady from Texas end up at UT Martin? So my dad moved us to Memphis when I was in high school. And, um, I'm going to tell you right now, I never in a million years dreamed I would stay in this area. I remember when we moved, I remember crossing (laughs) the river, seeing downtown Memphis. And, you know, of course I'm in high school, I'm going into my junior year. My parents Uh, have ripped me away from all my friends. Terrible time to move. Oh, I mean, it was just, it was literally the end of the world. Felt like it, certainly. And I remember seeing the downtown of Memphis and I, I just looked at my dad. I was like, where have you brought us? <laughs> There's no skyline, you know, compared to Houston. It is a little bit different. Um, and so I always thought I'd go back to Texas. I always thought I'd go back to Houston. Um, and, and that was my mindset. Uh, but the longer that I was in this area, the more I kind of fell in love with it. I, I started looking at schools um, in Tennessee specifically. And uh, UT Martin was actually probably on the bottom of my list. Um, I never would have thought I would have gone there. Such a small town. I mean, totally different from how I grew up. I'm a big city girl. Like, I'm used to the hustle and the bustle and sprawling and just tons of people. And so uh, it was the last place I visited because it's the last place I expected that I would go. And I mean, it just made an impression. I must admit, I, I loved it. I loved the people. Um, I loved the campus. And uh, there was just something about it. I don't know. It was so different from what I was used to. And what um, high school were you going to in Memphis? Uh, Cordova High School. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of on that Lakeland, Arlington side of Memphis. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I thought I was going to go into education, actually. I, I, was, I was kind of split between two different things, early education or um, news. And I looked into early education and while I really, really liked it, I love working with kids, um, students, um, but uh, news was really, news was where it was at for me. And I'm a fast paced person. I don't know if you could tell, I talk fast, I move (laughs) fast, I got a lot of energy. And so uh, TV news is a really great outlet for that. It really, really is. And do they have a, they have a a good program at UT Martin on journalism and? Yeah, a great communications department. Um, One of the things I, I loved about it and I still love about it. And it's what drew me back there to get my master's. I just finished getting my master's in December. Congratulations. Um, there. Yeah, I know. I, was, I wasn't sure it was going to happen. I'll be perfectly honest with you. There were a couple points there. Like, am I going to make it through? But, um, but I did. Uh, and I was able to graduate right before the pandemic. So I actually got to walk across the stage, which was wow. nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it's a small department. So you get a lot of one-on-one attention. And then um, the people that are in that department, Dr. Richard Robinson, um, Dr. Collard, uh, Mr. Freed, um, 
Dr. Nanny. I mean, there's just a, a ton of people up there that uh, they've worked in the business, they get it. And it's very practical, it's very practical driven. It's all about, it's all about getting, getting out of the experience, the tools and the skills that you need to get a job and to work in the real world, which is kind of important <laughs> if you're paying for an very. education. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I still keep in touch with all of them. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, it's a great, it's a great uh, group of people up there. And then actually you had Dr. Carver on uh, not too long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish he had been, he was, he's a cool chancellor. He really is. And he's yeah, taken he's that, great. he's taken that campus to a whole other level, to be perfectly honest. I, I've, I've been really impressed and, and excited to watch it grow. Yeah. You yeah, know, he's doing an amazing, amazing job. Um, yeah. Now you ended up in Memphis reporting for some of the local stations there, didn't you? Well, kind of. So I, that was my internship, actually. Okay. That tape that you saw that's on yeah. my Facebook page, that was my internship the summer before my senior year. And so, um, I was working, say working, um, I, I got an internship that basically let me make a tape, let me go out with the reporters, let me work with the photographers. Um, I wanted something that I was going to be able to get the experience. I mean, the only way you know how to, you know, you learn how to do a job is to do it. So, um, WREG offered that opportunity to me. And, um, I, I'm going to be honest with you, those reporters, like now that I'm in the position that I'm in and I know how tough it is to do the job and to pay attention to anything other than what you're doing, bless them for <laughs> taking the time to work with me. And I mean, they really, really did. Like Tom Powell was, um, somebody I worked really closely with, but then, and he's in Fort Wayne, Indiana now. But then uh, Roswell and Cena was the other reporter that I worked really, really closely with. And I mean, both of them, I mean, they were just constantly pushing me. They were like, do a stand up. We're out here. Do a stand up. We're out here. Write a, write a story. Uh, do this, do that. I mean, they were, do this interview, you know, handle this interview. And so they really like pushed me to actually do it, which kind of helped later on down the line when I needed to get a job and actually do the job. So, and then Roswell has like the coolest job now. Oh. He's working yeah. for the Library of Congress. It's neat. This business is so small. You know, it's 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 neat to see where people end up and how connected they are to people that you would never even have imagined, like you. That right. You never would have even imagined that um, we'd be connected. I mean, from totally different aspects of my life, but you all, we all are connected somehow. So yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> it, you, you, we say it all the time. It's a small world, but I'm constantly amazed by how small the world really is. <laughs> <laughs> like truly. So anyway, <laughs> so, um, you, ha you, ha you happen to be one of those rare people who has a job that is something they cover on TV all the time. If they want somebody to have a cool, interesting job on in a movie or a TV show, they're a news anchor. Um, <laughs> what, what, but most people don't really know what being a news anchor really is. What, what is your day yeah. like? What does a news anchor actually do? So, you know, the business has changed so much since I started, but some key things have, have stayed the same. Uh, the biggest parts of my day are not doing the newscast. That's probably the easiest part of my day, honestly. I get to sit down, the show's done. All I gotta do is, all I gotta do is present it to you. Um, it's everything that comes before and everything that comes after um, that is, you know, the work uh, and is the part that I love that gets me, you know, gets me jazzed up. Um, so, and that's a ton of writing. It's talking to people. Uh, it's asking questions. It's uh, now really engaging with our audience. Um, I was thinking about this last night, kind of thinking about what we would talk about uh, in this and what would be interesting. And I think one of the interest, most interesting aspects of, of this business right now is how dramatically it's changing and how quickly. You know, there's some key things that stay the same. Um, and that is, you know, great journalism is great journalism. Um, speaking truth to power. Uh, you know, getting the answers that, that people are looking for. Those are, those are things that are never going to change. But the way we do this now is just completely different than when I started 13, 14 years ago. So in 2008, I guess I would have been in my first year, second year-ish, going into my second year as a reporter. Our current GM sent out a memo. This is just to give you an example of how dramatically the industry has changed sent a memo to the newsroom that uh, we were not allowed to get on Facebook, that that was personal and that <laughs> we were not to get on Facebook at work. In fact, they actually blocked it at work for a little while um, so that people couldn't get on it. Now that is the first place we break news. 
that is where we get story ideas. That is how we communicate with our viewers. Um, a lot of my friends who be, work in, in media in similar positions of yours are required to post oh, yeah. a certain amount of things, no matter mm-hmm. what. I can neither I can neither confirm nor deny that there is a requirement. But yeah, there's a requirement. I mean, we're the ex, the expectation now is that we don't just gather the news; we engage with the viewer about the news. Um, so it's a conversation now. I also think people don't realize that that you don't just you're not just handed the news and then you sit there and read it. You no. actually. <laughs> you actually create it. I mean, you research, yeah. you interview, you write, um, mm-hmm. you know, so I think that's something that people don't realize that you're actually a journalist, yeah. not just reading yeah. what other people have, have yeah. written. You know, people see, and we, you know, the people that are on TV tend to get all the credit. And if you know anything about the news industry, you know, it's a team effort. I mean, there is a huge team of people um, that are in the newsroom that are gathering every single day um, every single minute. And so, you know, at five o'clock you see me on TV with my makeup and my shoulder pads and my, and I'm presenting the news to you in this calm fashion. Meanwhile, <laughs> we've been frantically and furiously putting things together in just a couple of hours to bring you all of that information. Um, I mean, I've got somebody like I'm wearing headphones right now so that I can hear you really well. But, um, in the studio, we wear something called an IFB. It's a little earpiece. And uh, the producer who has been in in charge of that newscast can actually talk to me while I'm doing the news and does regularly talk to me. They're giving me times, but they're also telling me if there's breaking news. Um, A lot of times I'll be reading a story and the producer will get in my ear and say, okay, the the next story, we've got to stay on camera with you. You need to ad lib X, Y, and Z. And so I've got to be able to stay focused on what I'm doing and what I'm presenting in the moment, but I also need to be thinking ahead of right after that, I have to remember X, Y, and Z to say on air with no uh, prompter, no script. So it's a combination of gathering and researching all day long and, and, and making sure all of that is pre-produced and ready, but it's also being on your toes and being ready for anything that can change because the news is now, right? It's not, it's no longer, here's what happened today. It's what's happening now. So you've got to be, you got to be ready for it, kind of tense and ready to go. <laughs> a lot, a, and a lot of people don't. Um, so when you're you're trying to write stories, you're researching. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. understand um, about the differences between journalism versus yeah. opinion journalism oh, yeah. versus editorial. Why don't you talk <laughs> a little bit about journalism today and what your role is in it? So journalism today is. I'm going to try to think of how to word this. There's a lot of good in journalism today. There's a lot of bad in journalism today. Um, and there's a lot of in between. I look at journalism today as undergoing, uh, uh, gosh, a revolution, if you will. Um, the business just looks, I mean, the example I gave you of Facebook, I mean, it's just one example of how dramatically the industry has changed. Um, my master's uh, thesis was um, all about how the viewer now sets the agenda for the news. So there's a, there's a theory in, in communications called agenda setting, okay? And basically what it says is, is that people that uh, are the news media, based on what they cover, and let's just say we lead with whatever it is, you know, the Paducah City Council, we lead with that at 10. That because we led with that story or because it's in the newscast, that tells the viewer that's an important thing that happened today. Not necessarily what to think about the story, but that because we covered it, that's a big story and that matters. Well, there's this idea, this kind of emerging theory, if you will, called reversed agenda setting, which is basically that the viewer is now telling us what's important, now telling the news what to cover um, based on that engagement we're able to hear from them. So that's a great thing. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and argue that it's not a good thing that we're able to engage and communicate with the viewer. I think that that means that we should, in theory, be able to serve the viewer better because we can talk with them and we know what matters to them and we can get, you know, we can actually serve them in a way that is useful to them as opposed to talking at them or talking with them. But the danger there is that you can start to get down this road of, well, this is what's getting attention and this is what gets people talking. And so we need, and there's so much competition out there right now 
that we need to get their attention so that we can survive as a news entity. And so you see a lot of these, I think you see a lot of these television stations and newspapers, um, 24 hour news networks are maybe putting focus on things that get attention, but aren't necessarily useful content for viewers. I wouldn't necessarily call it journalism. Um, you know, journalism also too, I, I think I'm, I'm more of a traditionalist. I believe that it is my job to gather the information and to give that information to you. Um, now that doesn't mean we can't uh, offer some uh, analysis at times, but I don't know that that's necessarily my job to offer analysis. I think it's my job to find someone who can offer analysis. Now, I, I think it's, it's, there are people that think that, oh, it's now the news's job to, to tell you what I think and to you know, give you the facts, but then tell you what I think about it. I think it probably now falls a little bit more in the middle. Um, I think it's okay as, as, a, as a journalist who has seen things to have an opinion, maybe. I don't know if I necessarily call it an opinion, but to give a little bit of context to situations. You know, if I've been working here for 13, 14 years, um, I, I understand how this community works. I've seen certain stories. It's possible for me to say, let's, let's say I'm covering a crime that happened, you know, 10 years ago that I was here for the crime and now the person's been charged and uh, they're going to trial. I think it's fair for me to be able to say, well, as a journalist, I've covered this and I've seen what this crime did to this community. I've talked to people. It's, it's impacted them. Um, I think that's a fair analysis because I've been here and I've seen it. Um, but, you know, when you start getting into the the talking head scenario, which you see a lot of 24 hour news networks kind of going toward, I don't know that I would, I don't know that I would call that uh, true journalism. I think that that's more of a talk show. Um, and they, those things absolutely have their place. I think what worries me a little bit is the lines are so blurred now. Uh, it's hard to tell the difference. Um, it's so easy as, and look, we all like to, it's uncomfortable to be around opinions that are different than our own. That's not easy for everybody, right? And so it's natural for us to want to be around people that share our views and share our thoughts. Well, now we have the ability not just to be around people that share our views and our thoughts. We have the ability to choose media content that is what we believe and what we think that's slanted in that direction. And those News entities are seeing the viewer's eyes go to them. And so they keep doing what works because it keeps them in business, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, and so the, the viewer naturally, uh, I think, and rightly so, is very critical of the media right now and, uh, uh, and should be. I, I mean, I, I'm critical of our industry. I, I think that it's important that we hold ourselves accountable. We hold everybody else accountable. We should hold ourselves accountable. Um, but we're not making it as easy for the viewer, I think, right now as we should be to know the difference between those things. I also think, though, that it's important that there needs to be accountability on the consumer side, that you know, you've got to be smart about what you choose and knowing the difference and exposing yourself to different thoughts and to different, um, to, to different legitimate news uh, media um, so that you aren't in an echo chamber of your own opinion. So, um, you know, the, and the other part that I think is a problem right now, and, and it, it, it's a good thing and a bad thing again, everything is moving at such light speed right now. I mean, you know, you buy a smartphone and a year later it's old and it's, you might, you know, it's, it's out of date. Um, it's the same thing with, with news. I mean, a, a year goes by and everything's totally different, but how can, how can entities like a WPSD in a local market, how can they keep up with those changes when it costs money to invest in technology, a lot of money? Um, so, you know, I think one thing that, that really helps is, is if, if especially local news, which I think is more important now than ever. Um, and for those that are watching and listening, you know, in, invest in your local news, um, watch it, consume it, read it. And I'm not just talking about local television. I'm talking about your local NPR. I'm talking about your local newspapers, um, your local radio stations. Like, listen, listen and watch and read because those, those matter. And we're seeing those entities really suffer right now um, because they're not getting the support that they need. Um, well, the biggest, the, to me, the biggest threat 
uh, uh-huh. from all that is what you said a while ago is speaking truth to power. If you mm. don't have anyone to speak truth to power, you, you, why don't you elaborate a little bit on what that uh, actually means? So I, our news director, I think it was Perry Box. He's been in the business a very long time. And uh, one of the things that he likes to say, and I could not agree with him more, is that a true democracy cannot exist without a free press. Just can't. It just can't. And I mean, that's why it's included in the First Amendment. (laughs) You know, there's some very important things in that First Amendment that we're seeing play out right now in real time. The right to protest, free press. I mean, those things are really important. So truth, speaking truth to power essentially is holding those accountable that are in powerful positions that you elected. And I don't care if they're Republican. I don't care if they're Democrat. I don't care if they, uh, if they don't hold to any political party. That's, that's not the point because everyone is capable of abusing that power. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what side of the political spectrum you stand on. We've seen it happen. So as a journalist, it's important for us to always be watching and always be questioning. And, and frankly, people that are in those positions that are in elected positions should expect that. Um, we're seeing more and more that, that um, and I think that's probably always been the case. It's more obvious now because of social media and we're, we're able to, people are able to express their displeasure at being questioned by the media um, more easily now and with a megaphone. But, um, but we're seeing a lot of people, you know, complain about that while well, you're picking on me. No, doing my job. <laughs> right. right. And I think, you know, I saw a post the other day where somebody had said the news is too skeptical. And, you know, I didn't post this, but my, in my head, I thought, well, the news is supposed to be skeptical. If they're not skeptical, then they're, Mm -hmm. that's PR. Yeah. The news is supposed to be a lot of things. Um, I I think that, that skeptical is one of them. Uh, I think that, uh, um, that you also, as a journalist, I try to look for the good. That's why I've, it's been amazing at the pandemic, unfortunately, has impacted it a little bit, and uh, we haven't been able to do our special series since that's be- begun because of resources and just being in person isn't an option. But I had this series called Service and Sacrifice, which I find local people that have served and sacrificed um, for their communities, for their country. It's been primarily veteran-driven. I've done a few things with you guys at Discovery Park of America. Were you there when the Title Lanham stuff happened? I was, I was. Oh, yeah. So that was one of my uh, first uh, service and sacrifice stories. That's uplifting. That's, you know, showing real people. Um, and, and I think those stories are important, too. Um, I think it's in, there are all kinds of things that the news should be. It's what's happening in your community. Um, but, yeah, uh, being skeptical. And, I mean, it, I, guess, I guess everybody wants things to be. The news is a hard thing to watch right now because there's a lot of bad in the world. And it's so easy to be con- easy to be consumed by it because you're not just watching the news at five o'clock anymore. You're literally consumed by it all day long. You're getting text alerts to your phone. You're looking at your news feed on Facebook. It's easy to feel overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed. I have to step back from it because it's just it's too much. It's just too much. Well, and and so COVID bringing up COVID. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you remember where you were when you first heard that? this might be something coming around the corner? So my sister is like the, we're all a little dramatic in my family. (laughs) Just a little bit dramatic. Todd and I, my my co-anchor Todd Faulkner, he likes to joke around, but I immediately go to a DEF CON 1 in every situation. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be the worst thing ever. And he usually will bring me back down. My sister, I'm the, I'm that in my that relationship with my sister. I'm more of the relax, it's okay. And she immediately goes to DEFCON one. Well, she had been talking about it since January, like legitimately concerned about it when she first started hearing about it. And I was sort of brushing it off. No, no, no. I really think that you know this isn't going to be a big deal. But that week in March, when I guess it was leading up to, and I remember it because it was my sister's birthday. March fourteenth was kind of that weekend where it all started going crazy. Um, that week, I really started taking it seriously. I remember Todd and I sort of looking at each other. There were a few things that happened in the news and some lockdowns were taking place and things like that. And we were like, okay, this is, this is different. This is starting to feel uh, very, very different um, because it was actually in our backyards. It was impacting us. You know, that's another thing about, I think, the, um, the world today. It is much smaller, but 
people ask us why we cover things that aren't local necessarily, like geographically, um, we focus on something called emotional geography because the world is a smaller place and we're so connected now. Things that, you know, make you feel something and that you can connect to, um, we feel is, is a worthy story of telling, whether it happened in our backyard or it happened in Oregon or it happened, you know, um, around the world. So um, it is important for us to cover what's happening in the Northeast or in the Northwest. Obviously, we're seeing that now because it's made its way <laughs> to where we live. Um, and it, and that, that can be the case. Things that are happening elsewhere can absolutely impact us um, where, we're, where we're living now. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it, that week was kind of an eye opener. Todd and I both were like, ah, uh, this, is, this is getting a little bit serious. So. so what do you think we're going through, you know, a very contentious election, COVID, mm -hmm. racial unrest? What do you think all of this is doing to change journalism longer term? Do you think when we get through all this, it'll be different? Yeah, I do. I think that one of the really interesting things that we're seeing come out of, and we've, we've been seeing it happen, but we're seeing it even more so now with these protests, um, citizen journalism. I mean the viewer is now becoming the journalist. They are our, our, our eyes and our ears, um, which is a great thing. I mean, they are, they are able to go places where maybe the journalist isn't. Um, so we're really starting to see journalism become more of a community effort, which I think is awesome. I also think that the danger there is, is that as journalists, one of, our, one of the important jobs we have is to serve as a gatekeeper. So what does that mean? Doesn't mean censoring the news, but it does mean looking for what's legitimate and vetting that and presenting what has been vetted and has been researched and has been looked into. We're seeing a lot of things get out there, make the rounds that have not been vetted and have not been researched and catch fire on social media and become some big story and go viral. But in several cases, we've seen that those things are not true, that those things are twisted. They're not the full story. Um, and it's hard to ever get the full story. You know, we, we, people talk about why doesn't, why don't journalists get both sides of the story? Because there are two sides to the story. There's usually like five or six sides <laughs> to the story, you know, and, and a lot of times stories develop and you have to follow them. You don't get it all in one, you know, take, you have to follow it over time um, because things develop and change. But um, so I think that, 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 Journalism will look different after this. It's already been impacted. Um, I mean, we, you know, I can't speak directly for what's happening at WPSD, but um, there are news entities across the country that have faced layoffs, that have faced furloughs. Um, a lot of those furloughs are not going to come back um, because, like most, uh, you know, companies, um, they're looking to trim the fat. And they're looking to do more with less. And in journalism, that's a that's potentially a bad thing. So that's why I say it's it's more important now than ever that we support local journalism um, so because we're seeing it disappear in certain cases. You're on social media a lot, like yeah. you know, all of us, and you see you see people sharing uh, stories that are to you obviously mm -hmm. not yeah. legit. You know, mm -hmm. how, how would you suggest that, you know, how do you tell your mom to know when something is not okay. really, because I've seen, um, sorry, mom, but I've seen my mom share things that I know aren't true. And I have to text her and say, mom, take that down. That is, that is not true. Yeah. And so how, how do you re suggest people self-regulate what they share? I mean, I, for me, it's as simple as Googling. You know, if you see something in a meme or you see something, you see something in an article that is an article that maybe you wouldn't, like from a source that's not a big source. Um, and I do this now. I do it because there's been a couple of times where I'm like, that is not true. And I Google it. I'm like, oh, actually, there is an element of truth to that. Yeah. From legitimate news sources that have actually vetted it and have the full story for the most part. Um Self-regulation is really important and just a simple Google and looking to see if multiple sources have vetted the information and legitimate sources have vetted the information. We're seeing all, again, you have, it's citizen journalism, but it's the ability to create journalism 
journalism and get it out there and people spread it, you see all of these uh, different um, news entities that are now coming out that are very clearly for one side or the other, Mm -hmm. um, conservative or liberal, that very clearly have an agenda, at least from a journalist's perspective. But again, it's harder for somebody that, that isn't educated in that and doesn't understand how journalism works and how it should work um, to get them the information that they need. So really it is about self-regulation. But you know, when I see people doing that, in, in, my initial reaction is to be enraged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on, you know? Because um, it is frustrating because there's so many people in journalism that are working so hard to try to get legitimate information out to people. Um, but I always try to take a step back and I try to, you know, figure out how to come at it from a constructive place. Because let's just be honest, if you come at people and saying, you know, how could you be so dumb as to share this? Or how could you think this? You're not going to get the reaction that you need. And frankly, it isn't about being dumb. It's, it's about ignorance, not understanding how it works. And so I try to come at it from a place of education. So here's how journalism is supposed to work. And here's why this is a problem. Um, and, and here's where you can go to find the information. I mean, you're still going to have, you're still going to have people that don't want to hear what you have to say. A lot of people that don't have want to hear what you have to say. Um, and that could be really maddening and frustrating. And so you just sort of have to move on. I've, I've had to tell myself this um, a lot, um, that you just sort of have to move on and, and hope that um, they can figure it out. But you can't, you know, you can't change everybody's mind, um, but you can do your best to educate. So it is about self-regulation, though. Hard for people. Yeah, no, and, and a lot of it, a lot of it is just propaganda and it aligns with their personal beliefs. So even if they know it's not necessarily news, they're probably mm-hmm. wanting to share it anyway because it validates their own yeah. personal opinion one way or the other. It's the echo chamber. Um, and it's, it's, again, it feels good to validate your feelings, to see something that is, that's what I think. I knew I was right. It feels good to be right. It's an ego thing. And so um, that's why I say it's really important to challenge our, our belief system and to expose ourselves to things that aren't necessarily, uh, don't necessarily fall in line with what we believe, um, but are clearly factual and, and is information. Um, on July the 4th, I posted something on my page that, um, you know, for me, it was on my personal page and on my fan page, but it's something that I think is so true right now. And this is, this is just for our country in general, because you see so much divisiveness and you see people are just so nasty to one another for believing different things or, or thinking something else or not agreeing with you. And it's that literally this country was brought together by our differences. Like it's what was, it was our differences that united us, that inspired the birth of this country. Um, we should celebrate that. We should celebrate that it, that's what brings us together. That's the one thing that unites us is that we're all different and we can all coexist um, as peacefully as possible. Um, and journalism should be about, uh, you know, exposing those differences. Um, that should be a big part of, of what we do. Well, what worries me is, you know, from journalism, you know, we went from a, a, a long era where people would flip through a newspaper and they yeah. would be they would be exposed to all kinds of thoughts and news and ideas. And yeah. now, thanks to the algorithm, we're served up, you know, only sections of the newspaper that align with our thinking one way or another. And so yeah. it's a big threat, I think, to to all it aspects is. of our life. It is a threat. And um, and that's such a good way of putting it. The algorithm, it does. It it serves up what it knows interests you. And I mean, that's great, right? We want to see things that interest us and are, and are along our belief system and line up with that. But again, being exposed to things is, is really important. But one of the other things I think that's a really big threat uh, to journalism right now um, is you have lots of people getting into it. There are still people that are getting into the business and that care about the business. What you unfortunately have is you have a lot of companies that are going away from keeping veteran journalists on staff. And generally speaking, newsrooms, especially in middle markets like, like us, mid low to mid high markets, you have a mix of people in the newsroom. You have people that are fresh out of school. You have people that have been in the business five to 10 years. 
you have people that have been in the business 20 to 30 years or longer. Um, and you would hope that there's a good mix of both so that you have the vets that are leading the way for the young. You have the young that are showing that reminding the vets, Hey, there's still, there's some new ways to do this, you know, keeping things energized and different and making them stay on their toes. Um, we're seeing more and more that, um, that veterans are leaving the industry. Um, they're disillusioned. The, they're, you know, their jobs are being cut. Um, they are making too much money for an industry that's starting to go cheaper and cheaper. And, uh, and then on top of that, so you have a, then a staff, a young, you have younger staff that cares about what they do, but it's just simply lacking in experience. You can't rush experience. You just have to live it. You just have to live it. You have to do it. And so a staff that's young and energetic, but lacking in experience and an industry that's moving at light speed, news that is now moving at light speed. We don't wait for five o'clock newscast to, to break news anymore. We have to break it immediately. And that's the expectation is that you break it immediately and you break it fast. And so there's very little room for error. There's very little room for the time that is necessary to do great journalism. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why I've really enjoyed working under the boss that I currently work under. He's been in the business so long. He really believes in taking the time. You know, we have, luckily, I, 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 and that's why I came back here. I, I went out to Colorado for a little while, and then I, I came back. I, I have great respect for this newsroom, and I have great respect for the people that I work alongside and the management team that believes in great journalism and in taking the time um, to work on things. But even in a newsroom like that, you know, the viewer, the expectation is, is that if you haven't reported on it first, then you must be doing something wrong. Um, and that's not always the case. It probably means that they're trying to do their due, due diligence to get the story right and to get as many aspects of the story as possible. So, um, and when you don't, you lose credibility. And, uh, and that's a major threat. Because then it's, we already are facing this situation where viewers don't know who to trust. And if they see you make a mistake, well, I can't trust you, you know? And, and so um, it just erodes. And once you've lost trust, it's really hard to get it back. So um, it's more important now than ever to be uh, diligent as a journalist um, and to be diligent as a, a news consumer and to understand it. So there's a lot going on out there right now, man. <laughs> so you, you've, you've, you've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of things in your career as a journalist and you have many more to see, but so far, <laughs> what is, or is there a favorite story that you've covered or that you've produced? Gosh, I've gotten to do, um, yeah, I've gotten to do a lot of really cool things. When I went to Colorado, just because of where it was and the timing, um, there were a lot of really interesting things happening. Um, uh, that was during the 2012 presidential a race in which Colorado was a swing state. So the candidates were coming all the time and they were doing a lot of local interviews. Um, so I was lucky enough to get to interview President Obama, which was quite uh, the experience. I don't know that I was ever, I ever thought I'd get to interview a sitting president. Um, that was really neat. Um, Jimmy Fallon, that was right when he was taking over for the Tonight Show and he was going around and he was going to like NBC flagship stations and there's a big one in Denver, KUSA. Um, he was going and visiting and basically promoting that he was taking over the Tonight Show. And so I got to sit down with him and I got to talk to him. Um, Elizabeth Smart came through Colorado and I got to talk to her, which was really fascinating. Um, she presented to, uh, she was a keynote speaker for an organization called Safe Passage, which is all about um, sexual assault, uh, particularly children and protecting them. Um, and of course, she's a survivor. And so um, that was really fascinating. Um, but I would have to say that probably there's probably two things that I can recall in my career that are the most impactful for me. Um, one of which was in Colorado and it was actually over two summers, but it was wildfire coverage. Um, the first summer I was there, we had the Waldo Canyon fire, which um, started kind of near like on the mountainside of Pikes Peak. And then it like basically hopped over a few mountains and it came down into Colorado Springs and it destroyed like 400 homes, killed people. Uh, I've never seen anything like that. I, it was, it was the most exhausting, um, frightening thing I've ever been a part of. Uh, people were, you know, we were on the air for like days without commercial breaks. And then the next summer, the same thing happened, the black forest fire, but it was even worse or 500 homes destroyed. 
Uh, we were on the air for four days straight, no commercial breaks. Um, the anchors were on 12 hour shifts. So at the time I was working nights. Um, so my co-anchor and I were on from noon to midnight and no scripts, just go. And that was quite the experience. Um, I didn't think it was possible for me to like push myself. It, it was from a journalist perspective, it was really like quite the event to be part of and to see and to cover and to um, see what it did to the community and how the community was not just impacted negatively, but then rebounded and came back even stronger. That was really neat. But then on a personal professional level, it was uh, a real test of my skills. Um, and I feel like made me a better journalist, um, you know, not just the experience, but those I was working alongside. Um, but then there was a story that I covered very early in my career. Uh, this was probably a couple of months into doing my job. And I didn't pitch the story. And, it, and it, I learned a lot of lessons from this. Um, <laughs> I didn't pitch the story. A, a photographer, a guy named Chad Darnell, um, who just left the, the industry uh, last year. He's now teaching at Marshall County High School. Um, an unbelievable journalist. I mean, the guy's a, an incredible photographer. I'm telling you that there is nobody better in the business than him. He's just put together some incredible stuff. Um, but he's also a journalist. I mean, the guy is just so connected and he knows how to talk to people. And he knows that stories are not always in the ob most obvious of places. And so that was probably one of the biggest lessons I learned from this. Um, he just happened to be looking on an online classified ad. He was looking for himself. And, and another lesson I learned from this is you always have to be paying attention as a journalist. Even when you're off work, you're never off. You know, if you're, if you're truly a journalist, you just always have your eyes open. You're always listening to people and what they're interested in and what is going on with them. And so he was scanning for something on BCI classifieds and he saw this ad that a guy had posted and this was in 2007, 2008. So this is when the recession was hitting and people were really struggling. A lot of the uh, big plants around here were closing. People were losing their jobs. So this guy um, lived in Calvert City, had posted this crossbow, this really nice crossbow, like a $600 crossbow um, that he was selling. And the ad basically read, um, you know, I'm selling this to keep the phone on um, and to keep the lights on. We basically sold everything else. I was holding on to this, but um, this is, you know, the, the last thing that that I love. I love, this is my hobby. This is my passion, but, um, you know, we really need to keep the, the phone on and the lights on. And he saw that and, um, he pitched it and they had us go out to Calvert city and, and basically go to where they lived. And when we rolled up, um, that morning, they had had an eviction notice taped to their door and, um, they were willing to talk to us. They had sold appliances. They had sold mm. all the kids' toys. I mean, they had sold anything and everything to try to stay in their house, even let go from one of the chemical plants. And so, um, and they were willing to talk to us about what they were going through. I mean, I guess for me, that was another lesson too, was first of all, how do you approach somebody who is in the worst moment of their life? It's an, it's an honor and a privilege as a journalist that, that you should take very seriously. You are in many cases, talking to people in the worst moments of their life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so you have to, there has to be compassion there. You know, we, we, a lot of journalists talk about how you got to toughen up and not feel what's going on. I disagree with that very much. I think that you have to protect yourself a bit because you do see some of the worst of the worst, but how could you possibly convey what someone else is feeling and going through if, if you don't feel it too, if you can't connect to them. And so, um, so you have to be respectful of that and honor that. And particularly if they are, you know, going through something that's bad, that's no, of no fault of their own, um, you shouldn't be pushing them to talk to you, but they were willing. And so they sat down and they shared their experience and that, that story got so much attention. We had so many people writing in and, and wanting to help them. Um, and it was just an example of, you know, yes, we get to do some really cool things. Like, it's cool that I got to interview President Obama. It's cool I got to interview Jimmy Fallon. It's, it's cool that I got to cover tornado cover, whatever. But it's in those moments that you realize that you can really make an impact by the stories that you tell. Um, 
just in connecting people to people. I mean, there were people that were contacting us that I guarantee you had nothing in common with that family, but were touched by them and were moved by them and could, could put themselves in that situation. They could know what it would feel like to lose everything and to have no control over it. And so um, that probably was, as, as being a young journalist early on in my career, I, I still look back and that's still a story for me that really set the tone um, as I was going to move forward in my career. So that's incredible. So I have one final question for you and it's kind of a selfish question. Um, how much do you love discovery <laughs> park of America? I love it so much. You don't even know right now. Like when that, so I'm going to be honest with you. I was really, really skeptical as, as a darn journalist star, <laughs> that that place would ever come to be. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, when I, went to school at UTM. We did not have a 24 hour Walmart in at Martin. We had to drive to Union City to go to the 24 hour Walmart. You know, <laughs> it's it's the it's the country to me, you know, I, I being from the big city. And so when it finally got built and we went down there, went to it, I mean, because we took my nephew. This is before I had my we've got a three year old, gonna be four in, in January. Um, took my nephew and I mean my sister and brother in law who live an hour outside of DC, we're just like jaws on the floor, like could not believe. And this was years ago. I mean, this was years ago. There's so much more that's been added to it now. Could not believe that Discovery Park of America is in our backyard. My kid loves it. Oh my gosh. I mean, and, and he, I can't wait to bring him back. We were hoping to get back this year. We haven't had a chance because of the pandemic hitting. Um, you know, the older that they get, the more they enjoy things. But, you know, he's always a hot mess when we go in there. He just wants to be all over the place. Um, but it's just it's just a really cool thing to have. It's a really cool resource. I think that it's done, that Discovery Park of America has brought Northwest Tennessee to another level. Um, and I'm really excited at your leadership. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> make your head any bigger, but, um, <laughs> but you've really like engaged. I, I look at you as kind of the Dr. Carver of Discovery Park of America. <laughs> wow. I feel like Thank Dr. you. Carver, he's taken UTM to another level as far as yeah. like engaging with, the, with the people and, um, and being accessible as a leader. Um, I think that's really important nowadays. And, um, uh, and as the leader of Discovery Park of America, you're accessible, you're visible. I mean, when I have gone and visited, uh, I've seen you there, you're there, you're walking, you're walking the halls, you're looking at stuff, you're talking to people. And, um, and I think that makes it even more special. Uh, it kind of, it, it people can, when they go there, they, it's something you'd find in a big city and yet you get that small town like connection of, you know, it's your neighborhood, it's your neighborhood museum. That's yep, really that's awesome. right. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for coming and visiting and thank you for all yeah. you do for all of us in, in this whole community. We're, we're on behalf of everybody. We're really grateful for the work that you do. Well, I'm grateful to be able to do the work. I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do this if, if it wasn't for the awesome community, you know, bringing me with open arms, even though I am a Texan. <laughs> I'm not from here. So thank you for having me. This is really fun. <laughs> thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.